So we're covering the book of Corinthians. This is lesson number 10. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not a textual study per se, it's not line by line, but rather topical study. We've selected uh, certain topics in the book of Corinthians and we're covering those from week to week. But there is, you know, there is some sequencing here. I'm not jumping around too much in the book. Started at the beginning, working my way through the book. As we've studied the chapters that lead up to chapter 13, we can see that the Corinthian congregation has its share of trouble. Um, for example, uh, there's been division because of pride and competition between the members. Um, there exists an ungrateful attitude towards the ones who originally brought them to Christ. Uh, Paul talks about sexual immorality that existed in the church. Not a warning against you know, something that might happen, but sexual immorality that actually existed in the church. A man was living with his, uh, his stepmother, which was a scandal. Uh, there were lawsuits among members, arguments, divorce problems and issues. They were judging each other and complaining about each other. There was poor behavior during worship, and of course, a lack of unity. So we're having, a, we're having a congregation that has a lot of problems. And one of the reasons uh, I said at the beginning that we're studying 1 Corinthians, because what a, what a great book it is, because all those same problems occur in the church today. Nothing has changed, because human nature hasn't changed. The, the nature of sin and its effect on individuals hasn't changed. So it's a marvelous book to study in order to deal with some of the issues that take place today. Now, normally it would take a library of books to deal with each of these issues, to give advice on how to correct these problems and avoid them in the future. Can you imagine division, ingratitude, uh, sexual immorality, lawsuits, divorce, you know how many books you could write about these particular, and how many have been written about these particular issues? So Paul is writing a letter. He hasn't got time to write you know, 16 books on, this, on these problems. So he summarizes the solution to these problems in just a few verses of chapter 13. The remedy, he says, for all of their problems is to begin to cultivate the character of love in the church. And in doing so, these problems will evaporate. So this morning I want us to examine this character of love, probably one of the most you know, repeated, printed, off-quoted sections of the New Testament that we have in 1 Corinthians 13. Now Paul, in describing the character of love, reveals three important elements about love that makes it so valuable to anyone, but especially to someone who says that they're a Christian. First of all, he says that love is essential. It's, it's a basic thing. You have to have it if you're a Christian. You can have the trappings of religion. You can even display the dynamic signs of religion. But if you don't love, you're missing the essence of what Christianity is all about, because Christianity is all about love. From beginning to end, Christianity is about, is about love. You know, it's like, a, you know, I remember when I was young, uh, younger, I was a teenager, and you have to understand that when I was a teenager in Montreal, owning a car, if you were a teenager owning a car, that was like almost unheard of. You know, we had very good mass transit, and we, it was an urban setting. Not like here, you know, when you're 16, it's almost like a divine right you know, that you have to have your car there. You know, maybe your first vehicle, you'll get it maybe when you start working. Because when I was a kid, there was no way that your parents would even buy you a car. If your parents didn't own a car, the chances were you wouldn't get a car. So that was our situation where I lived you know, in the city. And I remember one day walking by, a couple of my buddies were sitting in a car, parked on, at the curb right in front of their house. And they're sitting in the car and the radio's blasting, you know, and they're just sitting there, you know, listening to the radio, you know, and I'm walking by, I say, Mario, his name was Mario, Dominic, you guys got a car? Yeah, pretty cool, huh? 
Yeah, man, terrific, man, listen, listen to that radio, listen to that stereo. Yeah, let me turn it up for you. Ah, pretty good, eh? pretty cool. Yeah, man, well, let's go for a ride. Oh, we can't do that. What do you mean, you can't do that? Yeah, the motor doesn't work. <laughs> they bought a car from their uncle, had it towed to their house, <laughs> didn't work. All summer they sat in the car, listened to the radio. <laughs> Talk to the girls going by, hey, what's going on? You know? <laughs> well, Paul says that Christianity is like that. You can, have all the, you can have the radio going, you can have all kinds of things happening, but if you don't have love, the motor of Christianity, it's useless. And he uses three examples to demonstrate that love is essential for Christianity. In verse 1a, he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So he says, even if one displays miraculous signs, but doesn't love, his signs point to nothing. They're useless. You know, signs are given to verify that God is near. But without love, the signs are meaningless because God is only where love is. If there's no love, God's not there. Jesus rebuked those who thought that their ability to perform signs was enough in Matthew 7, 22 and 23. You know, did they not say, Lord, Lord, did we not perform many signs? So being able to perform a sign, and I don't understand all the spiritual connections there. Why would a person be able to perform a sign and not have, you know, I don't get all of that. I don't, pretend to understand the dynamics of that. But Paul is making it clear, someone who's showing signs or spiritual power of some kind, but has no love, they're not representing the God of the Bible. And then in verse two he says, and if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Pretty powerful stuff, you know. Knowledge, the ability to preach or prophesy, or having a strong faith is no substitute for love. It's not saying that those things are not important. It's just saying that you know the Bible well, that you can debate it with someone else, that you can win theological arguments. That, that's great. We need apologists for the faith, absolutely. We're not anti-academic, we're not anti-knowledge. But if that isn't coupled with a loving spirit, then there's something missing. All of that knowledge is for nothing. All of the teaching that we receive is to create love in our hearts. And if we don't love, we've obviously not put what we've learned into practice. Isn't that what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.5? He says, everything that we learn is to create what? Love from a pure heart. Imagine, that's the goal of our instruction. The goal of the teaching today is pretty obvious because I, I'm on 1 Corinthians 13, but the goal of all the teaching, the goal of all the exhortation, the goal of all the mentoring and discipling, the goal of that is to create in an individual a loving heart. And if we don't have that, then we've missed the point of the, uh, of the teaching. Then in verse three he goes on and says, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Here he's talking about zeal. Even zeal and generosity are misguided if not motivated by love. You know, people will die for ideals and they'll donate millions of dollars to causes that may help other people. But if they do it because of pride or misguided loyalty, their sacrifice for themselves in an eternal context amounts to nothing. Only giving out of love in the name of Christ. And Jesus says even just a glass of water has an eternal impact spiritually. So God looks into a person's heart and if his power and knowledge and works are not grounded in love, they have no value in the sight of, in the sight of God. So Paul, in talking about love as a solution for a lot of their problems, says, first of all, 
Love is essential. You've got to have it. If you don't have that, you know, we're, just, we're, playing, we're playing the wrong game. And secondly, he says, love is not only essential, but it's visible. You've got to be able to see it. And that is verse four to seven. Let me just read that. He says, love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, in other words, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now there are some things like power and faith and works which are legitimate if based on unseen love within a person's heart. Excuse me, I meant these are some of the things that make our faith legitimate. Because you can't see faith, can you? You can't see it, but you can see love. That's his point. Love is what confirms faith. And there are also, these are also visible attributes that are unmistakable signs that a person has love. You want to know if a person really loves, really is a loving person? Well, this is not an exhaustive list, of course. But he lists some of the visible signs that, you know, uh, that uh, prove that an individual has a loving heart. He says patience. I'll give you a, a little, some definitions here. Patience. Uh, all these Greek words have certain meanings that are translated into English. So patience means a willingness to bear with other people's meanness and weaknesses and offenses without losing our sense of love. That's patience. You know, I've mentioned this before. Patience isn't, I'm waiting for the plane. Come on, come on, come on, we're going to be late. I'm in line here. You know, I got to go through security. I want to, wake, I want to make my plane. What's wrong with that guy up there? Man alive, I should have got in the other line. You know, that, that agent seems a lot faster. Wait a minute, oh, that's a woman. She's talking, what's her problem? And someone says, what's wrong? Well, I'm being patient, I'm waiting. No, you're not. That's not patience. That's not patience. Patience, the, the key word in the virtue of patience is willingness. The willingness, I am willing to bear with other people's meanness and weaknesses and offenses. I'm willing to bear with other people's stuff. And then the other part of that is without losing my own sense of love for them. That's patience. Love is patient. He says love is kind and kindness is simply uh, the doing and the saying of good things, period. The doing and the saying of good things, especially about other people. You know, I often said the gospel is what brings people into the church, but it's kindness that keeps them into the church. More times I've interviewed people who have left the church for whatever reason, and more times than not, the reason that they don't come back many times is because they were hurt. There was an unkindness done to them. They were expecting love and they got unkindness. So many times, so important to build up the body, kindness. Love is kind. Love, he says, is not. He goes a couple of negative ones. He says, love is not jealous. Jealousy, interesting. Uh, jealousy, we are envious of another's blessings. And the root emotion of jealousy is fear. If you want to know what that, uh, you know, nobody likes to feel jealous because it, it hurts. It's right here in the solar plexus, right? We're like, oh, you know, we're jealous. You know? And that feeling, that emotional feeling, if you want to put your finger on it, it's fear. We're afraid that somebody's getting something that we're not going to get. Or we're afraid somebody's going to get something and we're going to have to give up something. He says, love is not jealous, is not afraid. Love does not brag, love is not arrogant. In other words, boastful, haughty, proud. Usually means someone who has an unjust measure of themselves. It's okay to think, hey, I can, you know, I don't know what, I, I'm a good bowler, you know, I can bowl, you know, my average is 279, wow. You know? I have a just measure of myself because I've competed and they've told me that my average is 279. Well, you know that. But if you're bowling 82 
and you're talking trash, maybe you ought not to. Maybe you have an unjust measure of yourself. Love does not do that. Love actually doesn't have a too low or too high measure of self. Love has a pretty accurate measure. You know who you are. You know what you can do. Love, he says, does not, not act un, unbecomingly, old-fashioned words. Today we would say thoughtless. Someone who, well, that was thoughtless, didn't you think? You know, unbecomingly is usually done by a person who's not thinking about anybody but themselves. How anything affects them, that's their first thought. Love is not like that. Love widens that circle to include the feelings and, 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 and the attitudes of other people. Love, he says, does not seek its own selfishness, self-centeredness. It's not just about me. And more th times than not, that business of it's not just about me happens when things are happening to us, either good or bad. And the temptation when something is happening to us, good or bad, is all of a sudden our whole life just becomes about us. My sore foot, my trouble, I lost my job, so and so. It just becomes about that. And I remember a person uh, once um, in the church, we were talking, they had cancer. And the problem with that was not so much that they had cancer, which is a serious thing, obviously, but, but that the cancer had become the center of their lives. And that's the part they didn't like. They didn't like the idea that every time somebody met them, the only thing they could say was, so how's the treatments, how are the treatments going? It was always, always about cancer. And, and the, the, the difficulty was that they were losing their identity the point was, hey, I'm not cancer, I'm me. I, I'm doing other stuff. I'm trying to go to work and I, I'm raising my children and I love my wife and so on and so forth. You know, there's more about my life than just my, my cancer. But it's so easy to allow something, good or bad, you know, to become the center of our lives. It just becomes about us. Love, he says, is not provoked. Not provoked. In other words, a loving person is not noted for having a bad temper or being oversensitive. You ever see people, like, ever know people like, oh, don't say that about, oh, they'll, don't set them off. You better not set off Uncle George because, oh boy, man, if you say that, don't go there. You know people say, don't go there. Love never says, don't go there. Love is not overly sensitive or easily provoked to anger, to depression, to withdrawal. Love, he says, does not count wrongs. Oh my, my, my. In other words, love does not keep score. Because when something happens to us, it's, it's human nature. Something happens to us, the first thing that goes into our mind, okay, it's okay, I'll remember that. When I was a kid, that was the threat. You know, I lived in a kind of a poor neighborhood and there were a lot of people getting beat up, me included. <laughs> and the only threat that we could make was, it's okay, you don't know when, you don't know how, trust me, I'm going to come for you. <laughs> Love does not count wrongs, especially in human relationship, especially in marriage. When I do marriage counseling, sometimes you know, I feel like a referee at an MMA event, keeping the brawlers apart. Why? Because some people think counseling is, I get to pull out of my bag all the bad stuff the other guy did with a witness. And the goal, many times, of counseling is to try to get one person to forgive the other person and try to get that person to forgive the other person so we can empty the bag out and move on. Love, he says, rejoices in right. It goes back to the positive. Loves to see what is right done, not wrong. Bears all things. The capacity to suffer much without complaint. In other words, it's eloquent. Love bears all things. When he's really saying love is not a whiner, 
Stop whining. Love, he says, believes all things. You know, uh, the thing about bears all things, sorry, one, one other comment. The idea about you know, no whining, this may be news to some people, but every single person has problems. <laughs> every single one. I know many of you, and I could go one after another, and at least you know, detail at least some problem that I know that you're having, whether it's a health issue or a family issue. If we understood that every single person in this building has a problem, then it'd be a little easier for us to bear. We could bear with one another because we know, you know maybe the other guy's walking straight, doesn't have you know, whatever physical issues, but you don't know what's going on inside. Maybe that young and the lovely sister who's smiling and so on and so forth has been trying to get pregnant for six years and has not been able to. And every night she cries to God to please. You know, we, don't, we don't know that. Then he says love believes all things. In other words, a loving person is not suspicious. You ever hear somebody say, you do something nice and they say, okay, what'd you do, come on. What's this for? No, no, I just, I just, uh, I just want to say you know, you're a good friend. Yeah, come on. What, did you put a dent in my car? Love is not suspicious. In other words, it believes all, not necessarily gullible, but not overly suspicious. Love takes things at face value. I once said to a person, uh, hey, if you're lying to me, it's on you. Because I believe what you're telling me. It's on you, it's not on me. God is not going to punish me for believing you, but He'll punish you for lying to me. Love hopes all things. In other words, not pessimistic or negative. Love is able to put things into God's hands. I, talk, I told you about my aunt, right, who's been dead 25 years. The most negative person I ever met, poor dear. Hey, wow, the rain's finally stopped. We're getting some nice sunny weather. Yeah, but the snow's coming in a month. And love, he says, endures all things. A willingness to learn, to bear with injury and inconvenience and hardship without losing our hope. So when we see things in people that we see uh, these type of, when we see these type of things in people, what we see is the character of Christian love within them. And note that these signs are not based on emotion. How somebody feels or attraction like sexual love, for example, or mutual interest or service like love between friends, or relationships like love between a family. The kind of love that I just described, that Paul describes here, is Christian love, and it is based on a decision, not a feeling. Because I don't naturally feel like not whining, because you know what, I want to whine. I want people to feel sorry for me. I want them to say, oh, you know, you are the center of the universe and let me feed that a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what I want naturally. But the kind of love that Paul is talking about here requires a decision, an adult decision. We decide that this is going to be the nature of our character, the nature of our love, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, directed by the word of God, the Lord creates this love in our hearts a little at a time as each day and each trial goes by. You ever wonder, why are you giving me so much trials? Because you don't know how to love yet. Because you don't know how to love yet. Because you don't know how to love me yet and you don't know how to love your neighbor yet. Not the only reason, but a lot of times <laughs> a major one. You know, we're not born with this kind of love. We cultivate it through prayer and practice and perseverance in the trials that we experience. That's one of the basic reasons God allows us to suffer trials, so that we can cultivate Christian love. The question is always, we go through the trial and God is saying, is this the point where you're stopping to love? Is this the moment where you're turning off the tap of grace for the others? You know, I call it spiritual stretching. You, know, you, ever been, you ever have to go to physical therapy for whatever, a broken arm or a sore back? I hate going to physical therapy. Why? Because those guys, they just want to hurt you, right? 
They just want to hurt you. And they smile. And they pretend, hey Mike, how's it going? You know, they're, Arr! well, if you're not bending my leg like a pretzel, I'd feel a whole lot better. Well, I think that's, that's what God does. We get rigid in our non-love, you know, and He has to give us some physical therapy that's painful to get that love muscle loose, functional. All right, so love is essential, he says. Love is visible, you can see it. And thirdly, love is eternal. Now the following is a complicated passage open to various interpretations, but before we get into it, we need to understand that Paul is talking about love and he says that its most important feature is that it is eternal. He says, love never fails. Now the reason for this is that love is God's essential character. 1 John 4.8 says God is love, that's His essential character. Now some things we need for now, things like prophecy and speaking in tongues and knowledge, but the day will come when these things will no longer be necessary because we will be able to experience freely our relationship with God. So we need the Bible, the written Bible now, we need ministers and we need this and we need that. But once we're with God, we won't need those things because we'll be with God. And the essence of the experience that we will have with God will not involve prophecy or tongues or knowledge or whatever. The core of our experience with God will be love. Someone says, what is it like in heaven? I will be in love with God and He will love me back. And I will be fitted with a body, a spiritual body that will enable me to receive as much love as He wants to give me, because now I can't. Now my capacity for love is about the size of a thimble. But then the new body, the no sin body, it will have the ability to fully receive everything that God wants to give me. Him loving us and us loving Him without the need for any assistance through prophecy or miracles or learning. This is the idea of the passage. Okay, now let's look at it. Verse eight, he says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. So after he declares the eternal nature of love, he explains that the other elements of Christianity, prophecy, tongues, knowledge, that they were experiencing at that time in a miraculous way back then in the first century, uh, and I need to give you a little background here, some in those days could predict the future or speak directly from God. Some could speak in languages that they had never learned, the, the gift of tongues. Others had wisdom and understanding of spiritual matters that they received directly with God without study, without training, because the scriptures hadn't been uh, 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 written or completely organized and distributed that early on. And so these gifts were necessary for the growth of the church since it did not yet possess the full revelation of God in the Bible. So God gave in a miraculous way the things that the Bible now provides for us in a natural way. So Paul says that these highly prized gifts that sometimes caused a lot of pride and division in the hands of sinful people, these gifts, he says, will eventually cease. They'll eventually disappear. Verse nine and verse 10, he says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. So he says that these abilities, even though experienced in a miraculous way, do not completely reveal what is to come. And this is where the difficulty, the interpretive difficulty comes in. For example, some people say that the perfect, you know when the perfect comes? Some people say that the perfect that's supposed to come is the full word of God, the complete Bible. And when the complete text of the Bible was fully produced, then the miraculous gifts stop. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that the perfect that he's talking about here is the second coming of Jesus. When Jesus comes, we will no longer need prophecy, tongues, knowledge in miraculous or natural ways because we will be face to face with Him. Now we're all 
allowed a personal opinion, my personal opinion here. I believe that Paul in this passage is referring to the second coming of Christ because this is more in keeping with the rest of the passage. However, this doesn't mean I believe in miraculous tongues or prophecy and knowledge today. I don't. I believe those things are past. Mm. Look carefully at what Paul says. He says, prophecy, tongues, knowledge will cease. I believe that these miraculous powers were given by the laying on of hands of the apostles, and when the apostles died, these powers were no longer available. That's what the Bible teaches. Their death and the death of their disciples who had this power was within a century of the distribution of the New Testament throughout the church. With the New Testament in hand, the church could do all the work previously done by those who possessed these miraculous powers. So in other words, the New Testament is now the tool by which we accomplish the things that had been done previously through people who had these miraculous gifts. Okay, you're following me? I'm, this is the preamble here. Okay, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Now listen, to this day, we still have partial knowledge. We still have partial prophecy, like it says in verse nine. How so? Can anyone here say that they understand perfectly all the information in the Bible? Really? All the spiritual and intellectual implications of every verse, can anyone say they have complete knowledge of that? Can anyone say that they understand all the prophecy of the Bible? If you do, please tell me who is the man of lawlessness that Paul talks about in Thessalonians? Or what will we be like in the resurrection? Can anyone describe that accurately? Or when will Jesus come? That's a prophecy. Anyone know that? So even though we have the entire word of God revealed to us and through it we can attain salvation and all godliness, we still only know in part, only understand prophecy in part, and will only have complete understanding when the perfect come. And the perfect is the coming of Jesus Christ. Now for the preachers out there, some claim that the Greek word refers to an inanimate object, the perfect. Well, the perfect can refer to the event of the second coming of Jesus, which would be grammatically and contextually correct. So for those who are kind of you know, going down to even that fine detail, there's the response to that. So in verse 11 and 12 he says, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, just as, also, uh, just as I also have been fully known. So Paul uses two analogies to drive home his point. First, growing up. Grown-ups put away their childish notions and ideas. And so he says to them, they should stop being proud about abilities that are only there to serve them for a time. And they should actually look forward to the object of their Christian experience, and that is the coming of Christ, and be ready for that by cultivating the character of love. And secondly, he uses another analogy, he uses the mirror. He talks about, the mirror he talks about is the understanding they had of God through the word of God. But God is not a word, He's a being. But at the moment all they know of Him is what they read, and they don't even understand everything that they read. Paul says when Jesus comes, then they won't just read about God, they will be in His presence and will see and know Him as God sees and knows them. Final verse, final idea. He says, but now abide in faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest is love. So Paul now goes back to his original point, and that is that love is eternal. Faith brings you to God. Hope sustains you while you wait to be in His presence. But love, he says, is eternal. And it is the actual experience that one will have eternally when Jesus comes to take us to heaven with Him. I don't need faith in heaven. I'm going to be face to face with God. I don't need hope in heaven. My hope will be fulfilled. The only thing left is love. So he encourages them to realize that love will be the lasting experience of Christianity and not to be proud of or try to hold on to the temporary gifts of prophecy and tongues and knowledge, which was creating all this trouble. All right, so let's summarize. 
We've had to kind of digress a little to explain a complicated passage. I don't want you to miss the essential lesson of this chapter, and that is love is the character of a Christian. It's essential, it's, it is the essential quality that confirms sincere faith and legitimate works. It is a visible quality that is very different from family and sexual love. It is eternal in nature and is the object towards which our knowledge and faith direct us and one day when Jesus comes, it will be the essence of our experience with God. Now I said that love is the character of Christianity because love is the character of Christ. And in this passage, you could say that Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind, Jesus is not jealous, Jesus does not brag, and so on and so forth. We abide in love because Jesus is love and we want to abide in Jesus ourselves as Christians in our day, in our age. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 13, that's one pass at it anyways. I appreciate your attention. We'll continue with our series next week. Thank you very much.